Hi guys, welcome to the High Yield Review for Reno. This review is set up in a matching game format. I would recommend that when I show you the slide without the answers, you pause on that slide, try and answer, um, the, try and match the things yourself. And once you're ready, unpause the video um, and then um, listen to the answers. Okay, so let's get started. We'll start with glomerulonephritis. So pause and unpause when you're ready for the answers. Glomerulonephritis is a spectrum of diseases. So we have the nephrotic spectrum, which is mostly uh, associated with proteinuria, so lots of protein in the urine. Um, and on histology, what we see is mostly changes to the architecture. So we do see a lot of membrane changes um, in most cases. On the other side of the spectrum, we have nephritic syndrome. Nephritic syndrome is associated mostly with hematuria. And what we see on histology is mostly um, a hypercellular glomeruli. It just looks really packed with cells. And you have diseases along the spectrum. Remember, lupus kind of spans the entire spectrum. So lupus can be anywhere from nephrotic to nephritic. Okay? IgA nephropathy tends to be more nephritic your anti-GBM disease, your uh, vasculitides associated with the ANCAs, so your p anca c anca diseases, your post-strep, um, all of these tend to be mostly um, more on the nephritic side. Then you have your minimal change, membranous, diabetic, amyloidosis, focal segmental, these tend to be more on the nephrotic side. And then your membranal pro proliferative tends to be kind of in the middle. Okay, moving on to the answers. HIV is, um, like, I, like we said, it's, it's um, mostly on the nephrotic side. It's associated, it's seen with focal segmental glomerulonephritis, which is mostly nephrotic. Um, hepatitis is associated with membranous and membrane proliferative, again, mostly nephrotic. GBS, group B strep pharyngitis, like we said, is associated with our acute proliferative uh, pro APGN, glomerulonephritis, and you're going to see those anti-streptolysin O titers in the kids. Wegner's or C. anca is that small vessel vasculitidae, which, uh, like I said, is um, the, your ANCAs, your P. anca, C. ANCAs. We call them the Pauci immune glomerulonephritis, where we don't see any Im immune complexes. Um, so Pauci immune is actually one of the diseases we see that falls under the category of rapidly progressing chromatolonephritides, RPGN. So what are some things we see in RPGN? We see Pauci immune, we see our good pasture, our anti-GBM, and we can also see immune complex mediated. So your lupus, your acute proliferative that um, can progress to an RPGN or a more serious condition. And we see IgA nephropathy, RPGN progresses to uh, your end-stage kidney disease or your chronic kidney disease, so it is, it is concerning. Okay, going back to our number five, henoshaline purpura. Um, this is, you know, your IgA nephropathy. Um, you're going to see those purpura on the skin, and uh, we, it's, we call it the, the burger disease. Okay, it falls under the burger disease. Then no complex formation and seen in kids. This is our minimal change disease, which is usually self-limiting. Uh, minimal change happens to be more nephrotic than nephritic. And then hematuria with nerve deafness and ocular defects. These three, they're like the triad of symptoms seen in Alport's disease. Okay, moving on to acid base. Again, pause and unpause when you're ready. So acid base disorders, you see ethylene glycol and antifreeze overdose gives you a high anion gap metabolic acidosis. It's the E in mud piles. Diarrhea. Diarrhea uh, gives you a normal anion gap metabolic acidosis. It's the D in hard ups, and I'll show you these mnemonics. COPD. Um, remember, these are um, hyperinflated lungs. They hold on to a lot of carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is acidic, so this is respiratory acidosis. Salicylates, anxiety, pulmonary embolisms, things that make you hyperventilate and lose carbon dioxide. 
they give you um, respiratory alkalosis and then vomiting is you're losing all that stomach acid that's just how i think of it and then that's going to be then your metabolic alkalosis since you're losing um, acid okay so that's your mud pies and hardips um, the D in mud piles is your diabetic ketoacidosis. The D in hardips is diarrhea, so don't confuse them. Secondary renal disease, pause, and then unpause when you're ready. Diabetic nephropathy. With diabetic nephropathy, we see pyelonephritis with papillary necrosis, and we also see arteriolosclerosis. Okay, so we do see changes in the arteries, arterial walls. Multiple myeloma. Multiple myeloma is associated with those amyloid light chains and uh, the Benz Jones proteins that are excreted in the urine. So very important. Third is our TB, bronchiectasis, rheumatoid arthritis. These are also amyloid associated um, um, diseases that can leak, progress to secondary renal disease. Lupus, like we said earlier, is kind of all over the spectrum of glomerulonephritis, but we also see mesangial and subendothelial deposits with lupus. Um, essential hypertension. Essential hypertension is uh, more of a chronic hypertension. So with chronic long-term hypertension, we see granular contracted atrophic kidneys. Compare this to malignant or more acute hypertensive episodes, we do see um, swollen kidneys, big kidneys with those pinpoint hemorrhages or the flea bitten appearance. And then last is renal artery stenosis. Renal artery stenosis in younger women, uh, mostly women, we do see fi this condition called fibromuscular dysplasia where, where the renal artery appears like beads on a string. In older, uh, mostly men, or older folks, if we see renal artery stenosis, it's mostly due to atherosclerosis. Okay, moving on. Uh, oh, here's just a little note on the four things the renal papillary necrosis is associated with. So sickle cell disease, diabetes, acute pyelonephritis, and high dose NSAID use. Okay, cystic kidney disease. So pause and unpause when you're ready. Remember you have a polycystic kidney disease, but you have two variants of the disease. There is the PKD1 gene associated or polycystin associated, uh, which is seen in adults. I just remember the adults as the autosomal dominant AD, AD in adults. So autosomal dominant version is seen in adults. This is mostly associated with berry aneurysms. Um, the polycystic kidney disease that we see in kids is the autosomal recessive version where we have a PKHD1 mutation in the fibrocystin gene. And this is mostly associated with our multiple liver cysts and hepatic fibrosis. Then we have dialysis acquired cysts. Remember, dialysis acquired cysts uh, progress to our renal cell carcinoma. There's also this thing called simple cysts. Simple cysts are benign. Um, and we see them with age and they're absolutely benign, but we do have to watch out for the dialysis acquired cysts. And then medullary sponge kidneys. Medullary sponge kidneys, um, cause, and, cause is unknown, but we do see an increased risk of calcium stones. Um, and then we, we see multiple cysts in the medulla or you know the, the terminal collecting ducts get dilated. Tubular interstitial diseases, so diseases that affect our PCT, DCT, all of those, the, the tubular part of the kidneys. So pause and unpause when you're ready. Aminoglycosides and ethylene glycol give us toxic acute tubular necrosis. Um, acute toxic acute tubular necrosis um, gives us extensive damage to the PCT but also to the ascending loop of Henle. There's also another type of acute tubular necrosis called ischemic ATN. Uh, in ischemic ATN, we mostly see damage to the PCT, but with toxic, we see damage to both the PCT and the ascending loop. Um, so that's that. Second is when we see WBC cast, so white blood cell cast, neutrophils, edema. 
neutrophils in WBC cast tells you that it's an acute pyelonephritis. Um, with acute pyelonephritis, we see enlarged swollen kidneys with papillary necrosis. Compare this to um, chronic pyelonephritis. In chronic pyelonephritis, we see thyroidization of the, of the renal like tissue, fibrosis, and mononuclear infiltrates, telling you it's more of a chronic infection. And what we see on gross appearance is we see uh, usually the poles of the kidneys tend to be depressed um, and with areas of fibrosis, so broad depressed areas of fibrosis um, on the poles with flattened papillae. Next is our post-chemotherapy. Uh, post-chemotherapy, we can get a tumor lysis syndrome because of all the tumor cells dying. And when they die, they release a lot of uric acid and uric acid, acute uric acid crystals um, can give you, um, you know, interstitial disease, specific, you know, specifically they collect in the medullary rays. With chronic um, uric acid, we see uh, more of a gouty appearance of the gouty appearance, we see little tophi um, on gross appearance. And then multiple myeloma is your associated with your Benz Jones proteins. Renal tumors, renal tumors, so pause and unpause when you're ready. Oops, sorry. Angiomyolipoma, um, you can actually break it down. Angio blood vessels, myo muscle lipoma, fat. Uh, so it's kind of affecting all of those. Angiomyolipoma is a benign tumor in the kidneys at first, can progress to malignancy. Um, it is associated with tuberous sclerosis. Um, another one uh, that you've probably seen in the cardio module is rhabdomyoma, which is also uh, associated with tuberous sclerosis. Okay, and then oncocytoma, uh, you basically see cell packed with mitochondria in this one. It's an, another benign tumor in the kidneys and on electron microscopy, we're gonna see a lot of mitochondria. Von Hippel-Lindau syndrome affects your kidneys, cerebellum, retina, pancreas. Um, so in the kidneys, what you get is clear cell renal cell carcinoma, you and associated with uh, the hemangioblastoma in your retina and cerebellum, pancreatic carcinoma. It's just like a syndrome. It's a group of disorders. And uh, renal cell carcinoma. Remember, it is um, it has a strong perineoplastic syndrome. That's usually how it's diagnosed. You can remember the the mnemonic pair. So PTTA, PTH, parathyroid, erythropoietin, ACTH, and renin are what are secreted by this cancer um, and usually presents with one of these perineoplastic syndrome in the patients. And fifth is nephroblastoma, also called Wilms tumor. It's the most common pediatric tumor. Um, and on histology, you see blastemas, or clusters of undifferentiated primitive cells. If it's in one kidney, unilateral, which is 90% um, of the times, it's uh, curable. If it's bilateral, which we see 10% of the times, um, that can lead to some problems with the treatment and prognosis. Okay, microbiology, just one slide on this one. So just some high yield stuff for UTIs. Pause and when you're ready, unpause. UTIs, you have um, nitride positive coffin lid crystals. This is something you see with uh, your proteus infections or your struvite stones, right? So, proteus and klebsiella both give you struvite stones. And then, second is a young woman sexually active organism is nitrite negative. This is your staph saprophyticus or honeymoon cystitis. Um, another one that's really common uh, in young women sexually active, but the organism is nitrite positive, would be your E. coli. Very, very common. Okay, three, associated with bladder cancer um, is your schistosoma hematobium. This is um, common in Egypt. The carrier is a snail. And if you go dip in the lake or the river, you can get it. And you usually see um, hematuria with uh, schistosoma hematobium and progression to squamous cell carcinoma. Okay, fourth is your nitrite negative, catalase negative. This is your enterococcus specialis. 
And fifth is your P Fimbriae virulence factor. And we see P Fimbriae virulence factor in E. coli, which is nitrite positive and one of the most common causes of UTIs. So just to show you pictures of your stones, you have calcium oxalate stones, um, which are envelope shaped. Uric acid are more of a, like a rhomboid shape. Struvite are coffin lid, and then cysteine crystals um, are hexagonal shaped. Okay, and the last slide for pharmacology. Again, this is not, um, extensive, but it, it is some high yield stuff. So pause and unpause when you're ready. Increase H plus excretion in the collecting ducts. This is your thiazide diuretics. They cause metabolic alkalosis. And um, so the answer here is C because they inhibit our sodium fluoride transporter in our DCT. Remember that the opposite of this are your um, um, sorry, my bad. Um, your diuretics that cause metabolic acidosis are your carbonic anhydrase inhibitors. Okay, so they would do the opposite of this. The carbonic anhydrase inhibitors cause metabolic acidosis. Okay, going back to um, second, treat Neisseria gonorrhea. And for Neisseria gonorrhea treatment, you would use a generation three cephalosporin, which is your ceftriaxone. Treat chlamydia, you would use either your azithromycin, which is a 50S macrolide, or doxycycline, which is a 30S um, inhibiting tetracycline. Usually, if someone comes in with gonorrhea, we end up, end up giving them ceftriaxone with doxycycline just to cover them for a possible chlamydia infection as well. So you usually treat both together. Next is our treat enterococcus specialis palinephritis, and our beta-lactams are um, our drug of choice for enterococcus, so ampicillin would be a good one. And treatment of congestive heart failure, your loop diuretics are great for heart failure. And um, that would be B, they inhibit the sodium potassium chloride transporter in the thick ascending loop. Okay, so that is it. Thank you guys um, for listening to me and I hope you um, enjoyed this review session. I will be posting the link to access these, accessing these slides in the description um, if you want to use these slides to study. Thank you.